thank you everybody for being here and joining us. I want to uh, welcome you on behalf of the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma and Columbia Journalism School to the world room here and to uh, from, child ref from child refugees to climate change, global challenges in an age of nationalism. This is a conversation with uh, Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces, who we are honored, pleased, and delighted to have here. She's, this is her first public appearance um, since coming to the end of her term as UN General Assembly President. Uh, I'll say more about her in a few minutes, but it's uh, an unusual privilege to be engaging with a world leader on such a wide range of issues. Um, we're here today at an extraordinary moment. Uh, young people in this city and around the world have gone out on strike today uh, in protest of worldwide inaction on climate change. And indeed, next week, uh, a global summit on climate change is going to convene thanks in part to President Espinosa's efforts at, at the UN. And at the same time, here at Columbia Journalism School, uh, some 30 journalists from around the world who are among you in this room now have been convening for a four-day intensive set of discussions on covering uh, children, refugees, and migration trying to look at the intersection of the first years of life and the global crisis of refugees and migration that is sweeping our planet, is tied into climate change, conflict, human rights, corruption, many other issues, and is one of the defining issues of our time. Um, that's the context for this conversation. This conversation is a keynote of that event. It's the only public event in what is otherwise a closed conversation among journalists, uh, scientists, and policymakers. Um, it's the third, and I need to say this, this is workshop, and tonight's event is the third in a series of programs on reporting issues in the first years of life that we at the DART Center have been putting on for the last couple of years um, through the generous support of four foundations who are also here tonight. I need to name them and acknowledge them because they, they took a big risk in supporting this work. Uh, the Bernard Van Leer Foundation of the Netherlands, the Jacobs Foundation of Switzerland, uh, the Maria Cecilia Suoto Vigidal Foundation of Brazil, and the Two Lilies Foundation, the Two Lilies Fund of the United States. This is a global effort to improve globally the reporting on early childhood and its intersection with critical issues like refugees and climate. Um, these are foundations that promote uh, global awareness of early childhood uh, development, that fund research in this area, but they have not until now been supporters of journalists and journalism. So we are moved and delighted that they've made a multi-year commitment that has brought all of us together and is changing the way reporting is done. Um, let me say a little bit about the evening and then I want to introduce one of my colleagues who will have a few words to say and then we'll come back. Um, this, as I said, will be a, a conversation with President Espinosa and with Deborah Amos, a friend and colleague who is the uh, international affairs correspondent for National Public Radio. Um, I really think of her job as just all things global. And uh, I'll say more about her in a few minutes, but um, she'll begin the conversation with President Espinosa, and then there'll be time for a conversation with all of you in the room. It'll be a chance to look at how some of these issues intersect, collide, to look back on an extraordinary year for the UN General Assembly and for President Espinosa, and perhaps to forecast forward where public attention needs to go on some of these important issues. Um, 
To get things going, I'd like to introduce one of our key partners in this, um, Michael Feigelson. Mike is the executive director of the Bernard Van Leer Foundation. And like all four of our foundation funders, is not just a funder, but is a key authority, instigator, disseminator of knowledge, and advocate. Um, Mike, come up and take us where we need to go. Um, so think of Bruce as the personification of, of a journalist, and think of me as the personification of a baby. Um, I'm serious. The, we are a foundation that's been working on early childhood development for uh, 70 years, uh, and, um, and that's really about the lives of, of babies and toddlers and the men and women who take care of them. And I, I, I was walking in, I saw someone with a placard over there, someone was at the climate strike. I, uh, I think it's you guys, no? Um, and I, I, so I wanted to, uh, what does it say? What is the yeah. Your piece of dirt gives pain to the earth. So uh, I, I mean, I, 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 I want to do something slightly unorthodox in recognition of the, the climate strike. And uh, uh, you'll understand soon why. But I'm going to ask everybody to stand up for a second. And I'm, I'm going to ask you to breathe with me. So first, just breathe normally. So this is the way an, an adult at rest breathes. Now I want you to double the pace, double the pace. This is more or less how a 12 year old breathes at rest. Now I want you to double again, so four times at the beginning. This is how a baby breathes. Now you can sit down. 95% of the children in the world are breathing air that is below what the World Health Organization says is okay. Babies and toddlers are taking in four times what you and I take. And what you also may not know is the air is actually dirtier the closer you get to the ground, so the air they breathe is dirtier. Think about a child of three years, about 95 centimeters, is literally looking into the exhaust pipe of a car. When I was looking at the pictures of the climate strike, which is wonderful, what was noticeable to me are where are the parents, where are the strollers? Now it's probably because the employers didn't let them take off from work to go to the strike, but these are some of the people who are most affected by coal, and cars and fossil fuels and the way it's making the air we breathe dirty. And it's not just affecting them today. We know, and the journalists are learning, how this affects their brains and their lungs and their future. But when we talk about climate and we talk about the crisis, we often forget what it looks like from a baby's point of view. We also know that climate is one of the drivers of what we expect to be unprecedented forced migration. People fleeing from their homes, not because they want to, but because they have to. And today, the UN Office of Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs estimates just above 130 million people in need of humanitarian protection support, about half forcibly displaced. Five million of those are pregnant women. So five million of them are gonna have a baby in the next nine months. 22 million, um, 22 million are children under five going through the most important developmental period of their life. And we don't actually know how many, but probably around 33 million are men and women who are taking care of them every day. So this group of people is not a marginal stakeholder to this crisis. They're a central one. And think again about your breath. Think about a child breathes when they have to flee, when they're afraid, when they uh, feel this kind of angst, and what we need to do to give them calm. The point that I want to make is these enormous issues 
that are so important are affecting babies, toddlers, the men and women who take care of them every day, probably more than anybody else. And yet when we talk about these stories, we often forget them because they're so small. What gives me great hope and great pleasure is we have the opportunity to hear from a world leader who doesn't do that, who doesn't forget about them, who does see these issues from the vantage point of a baby, of a toddler, of a new mother, of a new father, and has been bringing this message already to her community and to the world. So, estamos muy felices, eh, agradecidos de tenerle con nosotros, eh, pero más que eso, tenerla eh, en el puesto que ha estado y, eh, y poder ver el, el liderazgo que has desempeñado eh, y esperamos seguir trabajando juntos en el futuro. Gracias. Thank you. Okay, let me just do the f quick formal introductions and then we'll get this show on the road. And thank you, Mike, that was really eloquent and set the stage exactly right. Um, first, since there are some of you here who do not know the DART Center, uh, your host tonight is the DART Center for Journalism and Trauma. We are a project of Columbia Journalism School, now in its 20th year, convening journalists, um, scientists, clinicians, researchers to inform, prepare, train, and shape, and improve reporting on violence, conflict, and tragedy around the world. Uh, issues ranging from street crime, intimate partner violence, gender violence, up to war, and international human rights. We are a global project. We have trained journalists in at least 42 countries. Uh, we have full-time offices in Europe and the Asia Pacific, but we are based here at Columbia Journalism School. And as I explained earlier, this talk tonight is part of a multi-year initiative to prepare journalists for covering how issues of trauma and resilience play out in the first years of life and play out in the lives of those who are responsible for children and care for them. Um, Her Excellency Maria Fernanda Espinosa Garces is the president of the 73rd session of the General Assembly, which just closed, so she's just gone down the exit ramp, but uh, is still President Espinosa, as far as we are concerned. Uh, um, and she has more than 20 years of multilateral experience in international negotiations, peace, security, defense, disarmament, human rights, indigenous peoples, gender equality, sustainable development, environment, biodiversity, climate change, and multilateral cooperation. She served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs for Ecuador twice, the Minister of National Defense, and Coordinating Minister of Natural and Cultural Heritage. Such an extraordinarily rich range of portfolios is not, this is not your typical politician, right? Um, President Despinosa is also a poet, winner of her country's highest award for poetry. And uh, combine, did early work um, combining scientific and ethnographic research on indigenous communities. So she brings to the world of politics and policy and international peace and development an exceptionally broad and humane um, set of interests and commitments that I hope will inform our conversation tonight. Um, Deborah Amos is international correspondent for NPR, and um, most of you know that her reports can be heard on NPR's Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and Weekend Edition. She has won so many awards for her broadcast coverage I'm not even going to begin to list them. They, well, I'll begin to list them because they include the DuPont Award from this school, the Robert F. Kennedy Award for her reporting on refugees, and so many others. And she's also the Ferris Professor of Journalism at Princeton, where she is currently teaching a course on covering uh, migration and refugees. Um, I am now going to get out of the way and let you two take it from here. Thank you.
Welcome, everybody. Um, so the format for tonight is we are going to have a conversation, questions and answers for about 25 minutes, and then I'm going to open it up to all of you. Um, and because we're moving very quickly, we just have an hour to do all of these things, um, when we get to the questions uh, from the audience, I'm going to ask that we do two at a time. Uh, it just moves things along and we get more in. So let's do it that way when we get there. So I'm going to set my watch and 25 minutes from now, I'm going to turn it over to you. I want to start, we've been talking about numbers, how many breaths, I'm feeling that. <laughs> I don't know what that was, but dirty oh, air. Uh, yes, <laughs> it felt like dirty air. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can look at a generation. Um, half of all refugees are children. That's 29 million. Half of that are kids. 50 million children who have been displaced forcibly for economic reasons. Global. It's it's as big as a country. It's certainly bigger than many states in the United States. So uh, my question just to open this discussion is, how do we think about this generation, which it is, and have we failed them at the international level? Well, I think, uh, first of all, let me acknowledge our hosts today, if you allow me, Deborah. I know that you have we have short time, but uh, the Columbia Journalism School, I have to acknowledge the DART Center and Bruce for a very generous uh, introduction, to acknowledge Michael uh, and uh, your foundation, that I, I was really, uh, I didn't know that the Bernard Van Leer Foundation has worked on uh, early childhood development for 70 years, mm -hmm. seven zero. So that's, that's almost the age of the United Nations. So that's admirable. So thank you for that. And acknowledge uh, my dear sister and companion of dreams, Cecilia Vaca as well. In, in a big way, I'm here, you know, because of her. So uh, thank you and thank you all. You know, it is a privilege to be here. You are saying, uh, have we failed, um, you know, the current generation? Um, and, and I would say that um, who has failed the current generation? Uh, and, and I think it is a collective responsibility. I, I often hear, you know, but the UN is, is just, you know, a talk shop. What is that you're doing to resolve all the problems around the world? And I, I keep asking back, you know, the UN is us. The UN are not only the governments. The UN is also civil society, youth organizations women's groups, um, and we're all part of an international community. And what strikes me, um, uh, Deborah, is that uh, it's unbelievable, but we do have the knowledge. It's not that we do not know. We have the technologies. We know how to do it better, and yet we don't. So what comes in between? And um, and I have to say that it's a combination of things. It is not a simple answer. It's very easy to say, you know, it's because the UN is not working, or whatever, or X or Y government. I think that it's more profound than that. And what I would say, for example, it's uh, the need for stronger global leadership for collective action and shared responsibilities. And collective action meaning how is that we organize ourselves to take care of our global commons. And that includes the atmosphere. And that includes our oceans, our uh, biological diversity, but also an important public good, which is peace and security. So we all have, you know, it's a scalable responsibility on this, but uh, we do have, and the media, journalists, have a, a big stake here because, you know, they are the ones who translate what is happening in a way for public opinion. 
And um, when I had to choose, because every session at the UN, you have to choose a theme. The theme I chose for this year was to make the United Nations relevant for all. And every day during my tenure, I thought about the people in need. And sometimes I felt so frustrated. Uh, it also has to do not only with, uh, with the global leadership, but also a word in English that is very strong. And then you understand it's self-interest, but th that's another word I wanted to refer to, but greed. Greed is the word. There is some leadership. It's probably not the kind that you like to see. Um, we now have a race to the bottom uh, in terms <laughs> of, and there's, there's been leaders who, who learn from each other and how to do that. Um, and certainly that has been the case um, when it comes to refugee resettlement. Um, the Trump administration just might zero out an American program this year. As a matter of fact, it, the, the, it's likely that they will. Um, I, I was looking at uh, UN documents on refugees and, and there's a lot of talk about durable solutions. Um, if there's no resettlement, how can there be durable solutions for people? If that door shuts, if we don't have refugee resettlement in the numbers that we've seen in my lifetime, um, then what? Well, I, I think that, um, you know, the history of humanity has been, in I know that the, this is a quote that I got from somewhere, and I'm very responsible because I cannot put the name on the quote, but it's so true. It's because you're not a journalist. Yes, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, but in a way I'm also, I come from ac academia and you're not supposed to quote without knowing who, but this is very, very appropriate here. You know, the history of humanity is in a way the history of war, of religion, and of migration. You know, just look at century one until century 21. That has defined, in a way, and is defining very much so the, the, the situation of unrest and crisis that we live on today, with differences, you know, because here we have the issue of climate change. Thank you for taking part of the strike today. Um, it is about climate change, it is about cybersecurity, it is about violent extremism and terrorism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, uh, it, you know, refugees is, is a category of migrants that live in a permanent crisis situation. Not only the crisis that push them away, you know, but the crisis they live when they come to a new country or when they go to a new country. You're saying, well, the solution is resettlement. Yes, indeed, by my opinion, is that the solution is prevention first. Resettlement when they are already refugees. Unfortunately, the numbers are not good because the number of refugees are increasing. And I was uh, trying to look at the data because data can be so complicated, but you know, when, when you see the number of refugees, but pretty much the last numbers of UNCHR, the, the UN um, High Commissioner's Office for Refugees, I, I have deleted acronyms also from my language, which is very good, but uh, the, the last, you know, the last report talks about 72, 73 million refugees, half of them children, and, uh, and it's true. When they say children, it's it's like a, it simplifies reality. How about the babies? How about the mothers that are going to give birth? That that was right on. And I've been to many refugee camps, especially this year. Uh, what about them? But the issue of resettlement, uh, it's the ideal situation when they are already there. Uh, but we are really, I think, even worse on the prevention side. And the prevention side is, uh, you know, very tough because it is about, you know, uh, uh, combating 
uh, climate change, and I'm not even using climate change anymore. It is a climate emergency, and it is uh, a climate crisis that we're going through now. So if we do not tackle that, you will see, you know, more than 90 million new people, you know, just fleeing from their home countries because uh, of climate-related disasters. Uh, so we're not doing good. And uh, on the resettlement part, then you need one, one, one word again here, which is international solidarity, that unfortunately, one of the deficits we're facing is the solidarity deficit worldwide. You said that we know, and we do, uh, we know, if you look at the reasons for the 1951 UN Convention, it was because everyone at the UN understood that if we didn't have some sort of resettlement plan that Europe wouldn't make it. That, and, and it was done for that reason. It was to keep Europe stable, that there would be something that we could offer all these you know, displaced people after the Second World War. When I look around now, uh, you know, I've been talking about this today, the Al Hol camp where it's the kids of the ISIS fighters and no one is there. You know, there's not, U not UNHCR, not UNICEF, not all of the children's organizations and it's terrifying to think about how those children are, are growing up. But we also know this for thousands of children who are refugees now. Is there anyone at the UN that says, gee, it would be a bad idea to have a generation of you know, radicalized children? Or is it just something that people find easier to ignore? Well, I, I think first, I think it's very important to make the difference between migrants and refugees and internally displaced persons. Because um, I think that they require a different kind of protection, you know, Everything is about the human rights of these people to start with, no? But then there are different reasons, different motives. Uh, for example, uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, uh, new data came out on migrants, 272 million migrants. And that includes even, you know, uh, university students that go from one place to the other. Uh, others that migrate because of uh, a financial crisis and they want better opportunities. But when you look at um, internationally uh, display, um, internally displaced persons, it's because uh, there is a major uh, crisis or situation that push, pushes them to leave a country. And the refugees is an international protection status. And sometimes we get a little bit confused. When, when a country grants an in international protection status to a person, to a baby, to a child, it has responsibilities over these people. And that includes education, shelter, food, etc., etc., etc. Education is central there because because of that because of potential radicalization uh, because of uh, uh, feeling marginalized isolated i have a few numbers here that i would like to share with you but you know um, for example refugee enrollment in primary school is 63 percent 24 percent for secondary school and higher education three percent and the, these are, these are it's information of the new report uh, that came a few months ago. So this is really not right. No, it's pretty terrible. It's terrible. And it means, uh, and, and, and here we have to also be careful about stigmatizing uh, young refugees because it is not the refugees that then it automatically, because they didn't go to school, they didn't have the opportunities, then they automatically become radicalized. And, and I think we, we should be very careful about the narrative about refugees and migrants for that matter. So uh, these are human beings, they are entitled to their fundamental rights and their dignity and, and refugees in particular, they have another layer of protection because, because they are 
they have a refugee status because they're fleeing or, or escaping from a particular crisis situation. And that includes, of course, climate change, major climate-related disasters. Um, and we have hundreds of, of examples of that. I was, a few months ago, I went to Chad, uh, where there are seven million internally displaced persons. And it, it is the, the, the sad combination between the uh, incredible effects of climate change, because you know Lake Chad was uh, uh, the food provider area. It's uh, and you know better than I do. You perhaps know some of you perhaps have covered the Lake Chad and the and the Sahel crisis. You know better, but uh, uh, you see what are the opportunities, and unfortunately, young people connected to the Lake Chad crisis are also now become uh, a part of Boko Haram uh, because it's the only way that they can provide for food and protection for their own families. So it, it is complicated, but it is, uh, again, the blaming and shaming, I think that we, we have to be a little careful. It's the responsibility of the governments of that area of West Africa, of the inability of the international community to respond and have and overcome the solidarity deficit of the humanitarian response capacity that we have. It's all of the above. I mean, it's everything together. I mean, we are both, I think, in some ways describing a world system now where, you know, the, the richer companies are putting up the drawbridge um, and people who come from um, places that have climate change and conflict are trying to get in. And what we've seen is a step up in deterrence policies. Um, the idea is that if you make it tough enough that people will just stay where they are. Well, what happens instead, and this is statistically proven, is they take even more dangerous routes. Uh, if you block off the kind of dangerous ones, they'll take the really dangerous ones. They won't go home. Because at the end of the day, what's behind them is worse than what's in front of them. And that's the rule for migrants and refugees and everybody who flees. Um, and you can't really use deterrence. So, you know, yet again, I, I mean, I think we, we both are coming to the sort of description of uh, it's not going well. Um, so I'm going to ask you about that. As, as you, as the head of the UN General Assembly, are talking to states about how they want to do this, uh, there's no logic to these deterrence campaigns. You just force people into taking bigger risks. Is there talk at the UN of m sort of mitigating some of those dangers? Well, I, I think again here there are, there are perhaps three things. Uh, this year, in spite of the difficulties, we were able to adopt two very important instruments, the Global Compact on Migration and the Global Compact on Refugees. Uh, both are, um, I, would, I would say, um, like blueprints on policy and cooperation um, guidance for, for countries, but for all of them, it is about burden sharing and co-responsibility between countries of origin, of transit, and destination. Uh, and I think both instruments provide that, a platform, a reference point to encourage cooperation, exchange, good practices, etc. So but th that this is written in paper, <laughs> you know, now the, the main challenge is how is that we put in practice, we implement and we deliver on both compacts, the one on migration and the one on, on, on refugees. And I think that th the dialogue is there. And uh, I think that um, um, this dialogue is becoming more and more difficult because unfortunately we are experiencing um, a rise in nationalist sentiment of xenophobia, of intolerance that is happening now and today. And for me it's very difficult to understand that the issue of migration, for example, it's becoming one of the, I don't know if you, you use that word in English, but determinants for national elections, for example. And it, it is unbelievable that countries that 
uh, you know, were you know the highest numbers of their own people had to leave their own countries during the Second World War. Um, I was a few months ago. Um, I was in um, in um, um, the the camp in in Poland. Oh, I forgot now. Um, Auschwitz. Auschwitz. How can I forget? But I was in Auschwitz. If it wasn't because the solidarity of the entire world that received, you know, the Jewish people, you know, just escaping from from assassination and death, they they were they came to this country. They came to my country. They came. They went everywhere, and they were well received. And unfortunately, these same countries did not learn the lesson. Because now uh, there is this r strong reemergence of uh, very strong nationalism, um, and uh, the truth is that when you tell your people pu public opinion and when you're a politician, we have to take care of our own national interest, our people first. It so happens that national interest now and today is so much connected with global interest, you know, and global transboundary well-being of people. And uh, perhaps if we have, uh, we have time, there is a, you know, a project that I, I really see with great hope, which is, uh, you know, this new project, development project for the Northern Triangle in Central America and Mexico that basically took the Global Compact on Migration and translated into a, a very strong uh, prevention project where all the presidents got together and agreed on very key issues to prevent migration, especially dangerous migration uh, in the Northern Triangle. That is a very ambitious yet very interesting project in case you want to cover something. You know, we also need good news, encouraging news. The Northern Triangle project under the leadership of Mexico is a very interesting project to look at. And the, all the assistance and the, 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 the technical support uh, is coming from ECLAC, the Economic Commission for Ameri um, uh, Latin America and the Caribbean of the UN. You have a group of journalists in this room and nobody likes anything better when you're a journalist is to be given a good story. Um, I'm, I'm going to have one more short question before I open it up, and that is this. Do you think that we could open up the 1951 convention and add climate change? Do you think that would be a good idea? <laughs> well, unfortunately, the 1950, 1951 convention uh, does not have the key countries as signatories. So we need uh, more countries to sign to the com the 51 convention but if we were if we were to reopen the convention of course climate change should be at the at the uh, you know core and center of the convention but that's you think you could get that that's for at the, sure at the UN? not not right now not today <laughs> and uh, that's why we came out with uh, the global compact on refugees which i think is very contemporary and uh, you know and really translate what are the main drivers uh, for refugees, uh, and you don't need to be a magician to know that it's always conflict and crisis related. You know, if you ask here, all the journalists here, who in his or her right mind would leave home, family, belongings, the loved ones, and to just undertake an adventure to uh, that you don't know where it's going to lead you? and sometimes children and pregnant women. Do you, I mean, as humans, we do that because we want to? We like adventure? No. So our only responsibility is to make sure that migration is safe, regular, and organized, and that there is a, a global solidarity compact to understand that this movement of people is happening, but not now and today. It has happened since the origins of human society. So I think we need to get our act together. And here, one of the you know, main dangers is human trafficking. 
human trafficking is, is, is a crime. And 73% of the victims of human trafficking are women and girls. And here, another story. You know, look from the perspective of the babies. Uh, that really got me here, so thank you for that. But also from the perspective of women and girls, very much so, especially when you are dealing with human trafficking. Okay, I'm going to open this up, um, and I, we're going to do two questions at a time. Um, uh, pink in the front. And there's, do uh, you want them to come back to the microphone? Okay. You want to walk back? Yeah, thanks. Go ahead. Hello, um, my name is Ilgin Yorulmaz. I'm a freelance journalist from Turkey, and welcome to Colombia. Um, I joined the global climate strike today as a concerned parent, and uh, I met an Ecuadorian gentleman in his 50s um, from Milagro. And uh, his banner read, um, Ingenio Valdez is a sugar plant located in the middle of our city and it's killing us with its contamination. So this was really interesting for me because here was this Ecuadorian gentleman protesting in New York City. Um, now, Ecuador is a developing country and it needs obviously um, all the resources. Um, but how can the governments and institutions like the UN um, ensure that a country can attain economic development without sacrificing its natural resources and its environment. I think it's the age-old dilemma that I'm asking, and a very short answer would be appreciated. Thank you. And name, please. Good evening. Um, Madam Espinosa, do you think we should have a convention? Name. name, name. name. Oh, my name is Adesha Josh. <laughs> do you think we should have a convention on asi uh, for asylum seekers? What are the rules? Um, what kind of, what do they enjoy? I mean, what's the process? Because there's, a mi there's migrants and there is refugees. And the process in between, it takes seeking asylum. What are the rules? Because obviously it changes with every state. Okay. So on, on, the, first, um, on the first question regarding my, uh, my dear uh, brother from Milagro, um, and regarding your question on economic models, there are alternatives. There are alternatives, uh, plenty. Just read any description of the green economy and the, the global Green New Deal that I, I am working with a group of, of people. So it can be done, but it cannot be done by magic. Uh, there is a problem, and I have to be very honest with you, there is a problem on the political cycles of countries and politicians, uh, the kind of, of time frames that you have, and the time cycles of nature and the environment. And usually there is a disconnect between political cycles and environmental and nature cycles as well. So the idea is to connect the two uh, time cycles and to make them coincide and uh, I would be you know I wouldn't be telling the truth either if I said it can be done it's easy it is difficult it is a structural change in the way uh, the global south especially uh, build um, the economies and but there are alternatives it can be done it is called the green economy on the second question there is a refugee convention is the 1951 Vienna Convention on Refugees. I think it has to be signed by, by more countries. Now I don't have the, the numbers. Uh, and the as Asylum Convention, it's the Caracas Convention on Asylum. And there is already a convention. Oh, I was looking, uh, okay, you're there. So there are, I mean, the legal frameworks are there. They have to be translated into national policies. They have to be translated also in the, the way countries, receiving countries behave, but also countries of origin and transit. In the case of my country, the right of asylum and the right of refugees uh, not only uh, you know, comply with both conventions, the Caracas Convention and the Vienna Convention, but also we have put 
the rights for refugees and asylum seekers in our constitution and in our human mobility law. Um, we don't call people from different origins uh, foreigners or strangers, we, we call them people in human mobility and we have used this category so it can be done. Uh, so you, if you go to the microphone. I'll have two questions. Okay. I'm too short for this. Um, <laughs> hi, my name is um, Carol Moreno. I'm from Brazil. And I wanted to ask, in your time as president of the United Nations General Assembly, what was the thing that you did that was the best thing that you did there that you're most proud of? And what did you wish you could have done but didn't have time or didn't manage to do? Second question. My name is Pearl Matibi. I'm from Zimbabwe. First of all, I want to thank you for having had this platform and coming to engage on these issues because you're a woman and women very infrequently get this platform. I also want to thank you for bringing up the question, a couple of issues you mentioned, climate change, xenophobia, the issue on migration. What I'm asking you is, in your time, during your tenure, if you looked, for instance, at the SADC region, Cyclone Idai happened during your tenure. The xenophobia going on currently right now in South Africa was also happening prior to your leaving your office on Monday. What country or which countries in the SADC regions kept you up at night and why? Those are two good questions. Excellent. Question of something that I feel proud of. Um, perhaps two things. Um, in Sometimes, uh, you know, as women, we shouldn't be humble. Because, uh, say, I don't know what I did, but I can tell you two things, you know, two things. Uh, one is that um, I eradicated single-use plastics from the UN. And, um, and I'm very proud of that. Why? Because my first meeting with the management of the UN when I arrived, uh, I met with the Undersecretary for Management, et cetera, et cetera, and I said, well, we cannot afford, you know, being a, you know, full-fledged, single-use plastic place. The United Nations, we receive people from all over, I mean, this cannot happen. And, and basically the response I got, it cannot be done because of our procurement contracts, because of our catering system, because of, Okay, I said, okay, I will not take no for an answer. And in June 2019, we were able to um, completely eliminate single-use plastics from the UN headquarters, but also from our offices in Geneva, uh, in Vienna, in Nairobi. So that is something that I feel proud of. And this is going to be good for our oceans and a good to combat the climate crisis in a way. Can you put out a, a, uh, a laundry list of how you did it? Oh, <laughs> yeah, but then I don't have the time because, <laughs> but I had, uh, you know, my legal advisors look at the contracts that were an obstacle and we went through a, a very tough negotiation process with uh, uh, the procurement systems. And, but I, I also got the member states and the secretary general to back me to put pressure that helps also but any uh, yes and the number two thing that i feel proud of i i worked this year very much uh on um women in power to encourage young women to be in politics and to be and to actively participate in decision making because there the numbers are not right in 73 years 74 years of history of the united nations i'm only the fourth women on you know having the privilege to preside over the general assembly which is our the parliament of humanity in a way and i'm only and very proud to say the first latin american and caribbean woman and if you look at parliaments around the world the big companies everywhere uh, you know we are 50 percent of the world's population and then the numbers are not right 75 percent of the parliamentarians worldwide are still men so I, I work on that. I organized the first ever meeting of uh, female heads of state and government. There are 20 of them out of 193. They came and they mentored young 
uh, female leaders uh, in New York. So we, I worked during the, uh, the year uh, to make sure that the UN also had gender parity. Every panel, every ministerial level event, everything we did was about gender parity. My cabinet was 60% women. The co-facilitators, uh, the mediators on the negotiation processes at the UN, 54% women and men. So I, I did that intentionally. It was uh, you know, a big uh, cross-cutting issue of my presidency. I also feel proud of that, especially on the mentoring and encouragement part uh, for young women leaders. That's the number two. And uh, you said about disappointments or challenges. Um, I think that the um, architecture of the UN is extremely complex. It's a huge elephant. And uh, we are starting uh, uh, a reform process internally. And I would have liked to see the reform going faster. And, uh, and we have a great leader. We have a great secretary general. So um, I hope I hope that it's going to to really that we are going to deliver. I mean, we need to be an organization that is more accountable, more transparent, more efficient, and uh, we really do need um, to walk the talk in a way. So the question about SADC, uh, uh, about South Africa, um, about xenophobia, and if I didn't sleep at night, I didn't sleep many nights. Um, because uh, we also had recently, we saw what happened in Sri Lanka and Christchurch, uh, in the synagogue in California, um, what happened in the Mediterranean this summer, many nights. And um, the, the issue is that it, it is a question that I liked very much. And perhaps if you go to the web, the the website, you know, I would I would really like to share with you my my closing statement as president on Monday. And basically, what I said is that we cannot lose our capacity of feeling pain for others. And sometimes when you are in negotiations and running from one place to the other and you know having the political rec declaration ready and organizing five summit level that starting uh, tomorrow uh, at UN headquarters, you lose sight and you forget why is that you're there. And um, your capacity to, uh, um, to just uh, not be connected to the people that you're there to represent, uh, it's something that I, I, I am very afraid of. So basically my call was uh, not to be indifferent. And uh, this saying is it's just, you know, there is a Nobel, uh, um, is it? Nobel Prize. Again, I don't remember the name, but I remember the quote. Uh, when he said, it, it is a he, that the opposite of, uh, of hate, uh, the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. And, and I think that every day I reminded myself that. And every day I remembered, for example, the, um, the victims of Boko Haram that I met uh, in Chad, um, uh, the internally displaced women in Nigeria, I, I thought about them. And um, I do think about them um, because we, we cannot tr trivialize pain. And you're experts in covering areas of conflict and crisis. And uh, please do not lose your capacity of feeling pain and solidarity for others. And, uh, Sometimes this is not good for a politician, but uh, in a m I'm not embarrassed to say I am a female politician, but I, I am also a poet. Two more, two more questions. Let's have you. Um, good evening. My name is Fatiha Ayat. I am seven years old and an activist for rights of migrant children. 
I have delivered speech around different sessions in the United Nations to stop child abuse, gender discrimination, and domestic violence. I have raised my voice to make everyone conscious about the effects of global warming and climate change to the migrant children. Today, I actually have a comment, not a question. Do you, oh, we need a question, sweetie. No, we're, we're but I, I would like to listen to your comment. Okay. okay. Yeah. Today, I would like to draw your kind notice into an important topic. Yes, in today's world, children are escaping from their countries with their families. But that is not always po for political reasons. Climate-caused refugee children is also rapidly increasing. It is estimated that, by 2050, around 100 million children will be at risk to leave their homes as a result of deforestation, desertification, sea level rising, and extreme weather conditions. I'm sure you all know that recently, last month, Hurricane Dorian has struck um, Hawaii, uh, has struck Bahamas, and made a lot of children become refugees in Bahama and in the other islands. So time has come to integrate a age perspective by putting into the climate change agenda, by putting children into the center of design and decision making. Age sensitive policies must be identified and prioritized to help build resilience to climate induced disasters. So my plea to you is that please take action now. This is your generation who will, act, who will have to act. My generation cannot afford this climate challenge when we will be grown up because that will be too late to react. I know you are trying, but I don't think that's really hard enough. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your very, very powerful words. And when I was asked if I, what I feel proud of is uh, I also made sure that the voices of children and young people and women were present in everything uh, we did and organized this year. So, uh, of course, um, more than speaking, I think that we should learn how to listen more and better. And I listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next two questions. Uh, hello, I'm Jane McCall Politi on the NGO Committee on Migration. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, I'm just thinking about the tension between sovereignty and human rights, and thinking in particular of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. The child has a right to access to basic services, education, health care, and the littlest children in particular have an incredible need to have early childhood development programs, early childhood development, which is education and care. And the Global Compact for Migration, Global Compact on Refugees, had early childhood development written into them. But how do we, how do we push member states to resolve this tension between sovereignty and human rights in order to recognize and get them to implement the critical <coughs> services that these little children need for their future. <laughs> oh, we're gonna do two questions. Oh, okay. sorry. Okay. So, um, I think we already met in in the United Nations high-level meeting for uh, uni uh, universal health coverage, the civil society hearing a few months back, and I told you the same thing, we need more women in, in positions of, of leadership, and we are very proud of you, porque también soy Latino. So uh, thank you for your kind words uh, that you leave us uh, today. My question is, as a medical doctor who works uh, uh, providing humanitarian medical assistance in populations living under extreme marginalization, key vulnerable populations such as migrants or refugees. In Mexico on the southern border, um, I've been asked as part of the, um, of the uh, uh, political declaration on tuberculosis from last year's uh, HLM, 
to make some uh, screenings for, for the patients or the people that try to cross to my country. So now that you bring this uh, comment on, on what Mexico is doing uh, with El Salvador providing uh, uh, money and economic, uh, economic assistance for Guatemala so that they do not cross the border, I think they are also making us a civil society push them away and the, the barrier here will be tuberculosis. I fear that we will fall into discrimination and stigma and we are a civil society a tool to stop, uh, to stop them pro from passing. What can we do as civil society to uh, prevent this from happening? Well, thank you. First, the first question between, uh, you know, the tension between uh, human rights and sovereignty. Um, I think it, it is easier to explain the, the false dichotomy between uh, globalization, uh, collective action, and sovereignty. But the dichotomy between sovereignty and human rights, it's not acceptable because human rights have to be protected, exercised, and complied with in every corner of this planet. It has to be with the dignity of people where, wherever they are. And uh, we do have international instruments. The international human rights architecture is it's uh, very um, extensive. So we, there is no either or there. What I have to perhaps say is something that I learned when I was studying uh, the issues of early childhood. I, I have to acknowledge that I'm not an expert, but I, I am interested in uh, basically uh, when there is a crisis situation, um, you have uh, the uh, uh, humanitarian uh, architecture of the UN operating. We are the first in arriving into to a disaster area, for example, to a conflict area, et cetera, at the Bahamas or, um, or wherever, or Mozambique, wherever it's needed. But I think that the protocols for humanitarian assistance it is understandable. It is about shelter. It is about food. And then uh, when you, um, you have an established group, for example, of refugees, then the questions about uh, education, health, come as an afterthought. What I have learned um, is that in the humanitarian responses, you have to factor in early childhood services. And that is extremely important because it's, it's, it's a win-win, it's the best investment uh, for uh, refugee babies. Um, and that has to be part of the package, the natural thing to do. And I know it's not easy, I know it's not there, but it has to happen. That to it, it was a long, uh, short question, long answer, sorry. And your question about um, the issue of uh, tuberculosis and other diseases and migration. Uh, I think that what is one of the, the key issues. And if you follow the negotiations of the universal health coverage political declaration, you know that uh, there were countries that were very worried about providing health services to migrants. That is one of the issues that are still you um, know, being part of the conversation. In, in my opinion, universal health coverage should be applied 100% to people on the move, because here we're talking about 272 million people, you know, and we're talking about how many millions of children's, uh, children and babies. Uh, this political declaration, at the end, we were able to make it happen, so it's going to be adopted uh, by a heads of state on Monday but it wasn't an easy process. And you know, if you follow, you know what I'm talking about. And, and, uh, and, and I know also the situation in the Northern Triangle is not only Mexico and, and Guatemala, it is El Salvador and Honduras. It, it is a regional project, not only lo looking at, at health, but basically looking at uh, conflict, violence, and poverty uh, together. And um, and I think it's 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 uh, it's interesting and promising. Thank you. Two more questions. 
Hello, my name is Sean Shokumbi, and I have a consulting firm currently that's focused on uh, economic advancement for people who are um, in crisis situations. And I know a lot of the conversation has been around or centered around children, but I'm also thinking about the parents and their ability to build from scratch and their ability to pass something on to their um, children and the next generation to come. So my question for you is how do we make more intentional use of their waiting time at the refugee camps? I'll be going to Kenya, God willing, in November um, to address this issue. And for me, I come from the um, economic development side, so they equipping them with actual skills that they can um, apply once they do reach their, you know, their final destination, hopefully. Um, how, how can we be more intentional about thinking about equipping parents with the ability to build something economically that they can pass on to their children so that there's generational wealth being built, that this is not a situation that's going to repeat itself or create a cycle of poverty once they get there to their final um, place of destination. Hi, my name is Sarah Saka, and I'm a graduate student at the Policy School here. We talk about refugees a lot, but we tend to overlook Palestine refugees a lot in our conversation. Israel-Palestine is an ongoing conflict, but my question is, there is a lot of media from the UN around human rights transgressions and abuses by the, by the Israeli occupation, Gaza refugees both from the West Bank, Lebanon, all around. What needs to be done for these to go beyond press releases and get the world to actually care about the world's largest open air prison, refugees and refugee children? UNRWA is on the brink of collapse. There's a lot of, there's funding crisis. So I'm wondering um, what can be done and what really needs to be done on the part of the UN and heads of state to actually take action. Thank you. Yeah. First question on the um, refugees and the economic future of uh, of uh, you know their families. In a, I think that it has very much to do with uh, the way that hosting countries um, operate the uh, inclusion processes of refugees, and and pr I have seen all models, uh, w models that work better than others, but I can tell you, you know, firsthand uh, about my own country, Ecuador. Uh, we have been the country that hosts uh, the highest number of refugees in the Western Hemisphere for the past 20 years or so. And we do not have, in spite of, you know, speaking about uh, hundreds of thousands of Colombian refugees, um, we do not have refugee camps in Ecuador. Uh, the refugees, um, they basically, they are part of our society. They use our public services. They have work permits and they have a normal life. In my opinion, that should be the model. But when you have fluxes, unexpected fluxes, uh, because of, of a climate-related disasters, of a war, let's speak about Yemen or Syria, for example, then uh, different arrangements have to be made. But self-reliance, for me, it's uh, not only an economic right, but it is a psychological dignity right. And um, um, what we see is that investment in refugees is, is really very, very small. And uh, basically the emphasis uh, is on um, humanitarian responses to refugees, but very little about inclusion, about economic empowerment, about what comes after. And uh, perhaps there we have a little a debt that we have uh, with them. And that is a big question, of course. Uh, but there is no one size fits all, and there is no one single model of, of, of refugee uh, attention and provision of, of, of basic services. Regarding the question on Palestine, I, I have lost count of the number of resolutions that we have passed at the Security Council, at the General Assembly, at the Human Rights Council regarding uh, the situation of Palestinians. And uh, yes, the response of the UN has been through UNRWA, uh, you are very right. Uh, we had a, a problem. The problem is being addressed. Um, there was, uh, there is uh, the um, an oversight committee that is uh, looking at that. 
Um, and, and of course, uh, I think that we urgently need to re-energize UNRWA, which is a huge program uh, that exists to provide care and attention basically to an access to health and education to uh, Palestinian refugees. And, uh, and we need uh, the UN and we all need to get that act together. Um, I often refer to the, to the Palestinian issue as one open wound of the multilateral system. We do have a huge debt uh, with uh, the Palestinian people. And uh, I think that um, the only answer and the only possibility there, it's uh, through dialogue. Uh, the, the need for a, a serious negotiation at the table. There is no um, military solution for that. It's a long conflict that requires a serious negotiation process. And I think that the UN needs to have uh, a greater role. But you know, for dialogue and negotiation to happen, you need both sides to sit at the table, and it's not easy. It has not been easy. Maria Hernandez, I think you could be the president of this General Assembly. <laughs> <laughs> I thank you so very, very much for being with us tonight. I'm sure that we all learned something, and thank, thank you, you for the assignment. Thank you. Thank you.